Thanks very much, Dr. Stewart, for that uh, fascinating introduction to uh, stimuli and response, craving, desire, and behavior. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uri Shalev, and the title of his talk is What Can We Learn from Rats About Drug Relapse? Uri. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Dandra mentioned, I'm going to talk about relapse to drug abuse, but I also want to talk a bit about um, the methodology that we use uh, <clears throat> in the study of relapse, hence the title, What Can We Learn from the Rat About Relapse to Drug Use? Now, when we think about addiction and addicts, the image that we usually have in our mind is this low-life junkie hanging around in back alleys and uh, doing drugs. But uh, in effect, we all know of other addicts that are, are or were uh, very uh, talented, successful, and quite rich. So clearly, the problem with addiction uh, is not quitting uh, the drug abuse. As uh, Mark Twain mentioned many years ago, it's easy to quit smoking. I've done it hundreds of times. The, one of the major issues with uh, addiction, with the treatment of addiction, is the problem of relapse. Uh, in effect, most of the uh, addicts that will try to quit will uh, relapse, uh, about 80% of them will relapse within two years. And the question is, of course, why do they relapse? Most of them, most of the addicts are very intelligent people. Um, they are ver very well aware of the negative consequences uh, of their habits. Unfortunately, we do not have a very simple answer. But over the years, three factors have uh, risen as possible triggers, uh, major triggers for relapse. The first one is drug-related cues. And Jane mentioned the powerful effect that cues, that drug-associated cues may have over our behavior. So for a heroin addict, when you show him syringes or uh, needles, or for cocaine addict, when you show them uh, just white powder, this acts as a very strong trigger uh, for relapse. Another known factor is re-exposure to drugs. Uh, a single exposure to a dose of the drug uh, might act also as a very uh, reliable trigger to uh, relapse. And this is probably the reason that when you join uh, Alcoholic Anonymous, they tell you never, ever try another drop of alcohol, not under any circumstances, religious or social, because that might be the trigger that will cause you to uh, relapse. And finally, there is stress. When you ask uh, most of the addicts, or many of the addicts, you were doing so fine, why did you relapse after so long? They'll say, well, oh, just life became too stressful. And uh, stress is known as, or stressful life events are known as one of the major reasons for relapse uh, in addicts. Now, in today's talk, I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, the effect of stress and the drug-related cues. And the question is, uh, the first question is, how do we study relapse to drugs? One option, of course, is to uh, use addicts as subjects. And indeed, many studies are doing just that. There are a few problems with this approach. One of the problems is that most of these studies are retrospective in nature. You're asking an addict, why did you relapse following the relapse? Now, we know that we are very good at coming up with good excuses, right? We are good at rationalizing our behavior, so there is a bit of a problem there. Another reason, and maybe more important one for us as neuroscientists, is that we are interested in the underlying brain mechanisms. Unfortunately, at this point in time, we are unable to get to the level of, uh, uh, of acuity in the study of the brain uh, in human subjects. So we go for the next best thing. And these are animal models. In my case, uh, these are uh, rats. How do we study relapse to drugs in rats? Well, first thing, of course, we need to train them to take the drugs. Fortunately, as Jane mentioned, rats will happily self-administer most of the drugs that are abused uh, by uh, humans, so it's relatively easy. It's uh, uh, quite easy to train them to self-administer drugs. 
of course, our uh, setup looks more like this. This is uh, an, a Skinner box. Our rats are implanted with uh, intravenous catheter. Uh, a tube then connects them to uh, a syringe with a drug of choice, the drug of the day. It could be heroin or cocaine or any drug uh, that you can think of. And the rats are trained to press a lever here in order to self-administer themselves with the dose of the drug. They have full control over the amount of drug that they want, over the timing, and they learn uh, the habit very quickly. One other thing that we do is that we program the system in such a way that some kind of cue is always associated with the infusion of the drug. In this case, this would be a light cue, but we can also uh, add a tone, a specific tone, when the uh, drug is infused. The model that we, are, that we are using is called the reinstatement procedure. This procedure was uh, developed uh, by Harriet DeVitt and Jane Stewart here at Concordia in the early 80s, and it is now the most common uh, model in the study of uh, drug abuse and relapse uh, uh, specifically. There are three phases uh, in this uh, uh, procedure. The first one is the training. What you can see here is an example of the responses of a rat over uh, the continuing uh, training. So they quite quickly learn to self-administer the drug and then they develop their individual prefer preferred rate of self-administration. Once they get to that level, we take the drug away. We cannot ask the rats, unfortunately, to quit for a while. So we have to remove the drug from the system and the rats become very frustrated. They press that liver many, many times on the first session, on the first day, they are quite frustrated. And we can understand that. I mean, when we are waiting for, a, for an elevator and it's not coming and we are in a hurry, we will press it again and again as if it would help. But rats are quite intelligent creatures, so very quickly they understand there is no use doing it, and they extinguish the behavior. Once the behavior has almost totally extinguished, they press very little for the drug, we can introduce any one of those manipulation, of those factors that we know uh, induce relapse in humans. This could be drug priming. We can just give them one injection of the drug to prime the system. We can uh, introduce or reintroduce drug-associated cues like those lights or tones, and we can stress the animals uh, in several ways. And uh, what we usually see is that there is relapse, there is reinstatement of the drug-seeking behavior. Now, you need to remember that there is no drug in the system. What we see is pure drug-seeking behavior. Now, I want to show you some real data. In this case, we have two groups of rats. One group was uh, trained with uh, heroin. They were trained to self-administer heroin in those black squares. Another group was trained to self-administer saline as a control. These are the white squares here. As you can see, the uh, uh, rats that were trained on heroin very quickly learn to respond for, that, uh, for the drug, for heroin, and they develop a kind of a steady uh, level of self-administration. And if you go and cut their dose, if you reduce their dose by half, they will increase the number of responses. They have, they prefer those, and they will work harder in order to get there. And again, they will develop this kind of consistent behavior. On the other hand, the rats that are trained with saline, at first they kind of like it, so they, they, uh, they press the liver quite a lot because it's fun. I mean, you have the light, you have the tone, something is happening. But over time, as you can see, the behavior disappears. Now we take the heroin away from the system, and as you can see here, at first the heroin-trained drugs are uh, pressing quite a lot, but over time the number of responses just reduces, the behavior is extinguished. And uh, the, with the saline-trained uh, uh, animals, nothing much is happening. Uh, there's no difference from their point of view. So this is the training and extinction. What about the reinstatement? This is an example of cue-induced relapse. The animals were re-exposed to drug-associated cues. Now, what we see here are groups of animals that were exposed to those cues at different time points after training. So let's just look at the animal that, animals that were exposed to these cues after seven days. What you see in the black bar, on the black bar, is the relapse effect. The animals that were exposed to the cues now respond much more compared to the number of responses during the last day of extinction. This is 
relapse. There is another very interesting point in this experiment. As you can see, over time, as the abstinence is actually longer, as the, the longer the time from the last exposure to the drug, in this case it's cocaine, the effect of the cue is getting stronger. This was termed incubation of cocaine craving. Actually, this group also went ahead and tested the uh, effects of cues uh, three months after the last exposure to the drug, and the effect was even higher. Only after six months, the relapse level kind of dropped. And there were still relapse, but it was a bit lower, not as much as, in after, as after two months or three months. And now you need to, re to think in, uh, in a scale of rat years. Rat has a life expectancy of about two and a half years or so, two to three years. Six months is a huge amount of time. And the effect of the cues is extremely, extremely powerful. So this is cue-induced relapse. Can we see that in humans as well? It is interesting that the incubation effect was first described in animals. Only now we have description, we have uh, studies that are starting to show the incubation effect in humans. This is a very recent, uh, uh, very recent uh, example by Harriet DeWitt. And what you can see here is that smokers that are exposed to uh, smoking-related cues, like images or videos, actually increase their craving rating over abstinence period. So again, incubation of uh, the smoking craving effect. What about stress-induced relapse? This is an example in rats of food shock, mild food shock-induced relapse. In this case, the animals are zapped in, with very, very mild food shock just before the test session. And if we look at animals that were tested with uh, food shock stress after six days of abstinence, we see a very strong relapse effect compared to the number of responses on the last day of extinction. And again, we see a kind of an incubation of the craving effect, of the food shock induced uh, craving effect or food shock induced relapse. In this case, by the way, the animals were uh, trained with heroin. So these are heroin trained animals. As I've said, stress is very uh, effective uh, in uh, uh, relapse uh, in humans, and these are studies in more con under more controlled conditions. What they do here is they, they bring in the addicts and they work with them to develop a script of a very stressful uh, scenario, something that is very re relevant to that person. Uh, quarrel with, uh, with a spouse or a loss of a dear one. And then during the test, this script is reread to them and they are asked to imagine that this is happening to them. And as you can see, when you test it in alcohol patients, in alcoholics, or in cocaine patients, when you read them this, when you read that script to them, they, ra they have a high ranking of craving, which you don't see with social drinkers. If you read to them neutral scripts, again, nothing much. And of course, if you show them cues that are associated with alcohol or with cocaine, you get this very strong craving rating. So this works in humans as well. Now, for a while I was working with food shock induced uh, relapse, and then at some point I got more interested in another type of stressor, and that, that's of uh, stressor uh, hunger or food deprivation. Uh, I just thought that hunger or food deprivation might be more ecologically relevant uh, to relapse than uh, food shocking uh, addicts. And actually we know that hunger and food deprivation have strong effects on over uh, drug taking. For example, uh, South American Indians increase their coca leaf chewing uh, when they're under diet restricted conditions. Also, every smoker will tell you that when you try to quit smoking, you gain weight. You eat more and you gain weight. If you try to control your body weight, if you try to control your eating, you are at a much higher risk for relapse. Another interesting point is that there is high comorbidity between eating disorders and drug abuse. abuse and this is especially true uh, for uh, bulimic patients that show very high rates of comorbid uh, drug problems. 
Now, can food deprivation uh, induce relapse to drug seeking in our model? And as it's kind of fashionable to say now, yes, it can. Uh, this is an example of the effect of 21 hours of food deprivation on relapse to drug seeking in heroin trained rats. So this is the effect of 21 hours compared to the last day or to the no food deprivation condition. One hour, by the way, was not enough. We also demonstrated this effect in mice with cocaine trained mice. Again, the relapse effect compared to the last, to the no uh, food deprivation uh, condition. What's interesting is that one hour is enough in mice to induce relapse to uh, cocaine seeking. One hour of food deprivation is enough. And of course, why would uh, dietary restriction affect drug-related behaviors? Why would a hungry rat turn to a liver that was associated with drugs. One obvious reason would be stress. We said that stress is a powerful trigger for relapse, uh, and food deprivation is definitely stress, and we have data that are supporting, that support this, uh, uh, this hypothesis. But another interesting uh, option is related to the overlap between the neural mechanisms that underlie feeding and drug seeking. And actually, this, uh, this hypothesis was summarized very nicely by uh, Olga Volkov and uh, uh, the uh, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse and Roy Waz in 2005, when they wrote that there is a considerable overlap between brain secretory that evolved in the service of body weight regulation and brain secretory that is usurped by exogenous drugs of abuse. With that in mind, there are two ways that we can approach relapse or food deprivation induced relapse. One way is to manipulate the drug seeking pathway. And Jane mentioned, of course, dopamine. Dopamine is very important for the uh, rewarding effects of drugs, but it is also very important for natural non drug uh, rewards. And indeed, if we block dopamine transmission, if we block the dopamine system with dopamine antagonist, we can attenuate the effect of food deprivation. But another, maybe more interesting option is if we manipulate the food seeking pathways. Now for that we used leptin. Leptin is a hormone that is released by the fat tissue and it serves as a signal from the body to the brain telling it what's the situation with our energy reserves, energy storage. If you have more fat, there should, you, should, you should have more leptin and you should eat less. How important is that signal? What you see here on the right is a mouse, a mutant mouse, that has no ability to produce leptin. As, as you can see, it turns quite chubby. On the left, you see the same genetically identical mouse that has been injected with leptin and has no problems keeping normal body weight. So we wanted to see what happens if we inject leptin just before the test. So the animals are food deprived as before, but now just before we te the test we inject them with leptin. As, as, you can, as you can see here, we completely block the food deprivation effect. What's interesting also is that leptin has no effect on food shock induced relapse or on heroin priming induced relapse. It is just as strong as before. So I want to finish up with what have we learned from the rat. First, we learned that craving for drugs incubates uh, over abstinence periods, which is a very disturbing finding. It means that addicts are getting more sensitive to the effects of, of cues and stress the longer the abstinence period, which means once they leave that clinic, they are actually more sensitive to relapse. Another fact, another uh, thing we've learned is that food deprivation may be a strong trigger for, re for relapse, and we know that addicts usually have a not too balanced diet, which can, can, may induce uh, a kind of a vicious uh, cycle. The, cycle. Uh, the neural mechanisms that underlie food seeking largely overlap with those that mediate drug seeking, and identifying this system would help in developing, we hope, and developing targeted treatments for drug dependence and some types of uh, eating disorders. Now, all this work was done with the help of many people at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, colleagues and uh, collaborators here at the CSBN, my graduate students, Stefan Tobin and Tia Marek, uh, undergraduate students that have done a great job in the lab and, of course, funding agencies. Thank you. <laughs>